For this set of lectures, we'll be talking about aggression, and specifically here, we're going to focus on whether aggression is innate or learned, or some combination of both. Defining aggression, it's oftentimes thought of as an intentional behavior aimed at causing some type of physical or psychological or even emotional harm or pain to another person. And the intention matters a lot in this case. So if there is no intention to do harm and one still ends up hurting another person or another living thing for that matter, so long as the intention is absent, we would technically not qualify it as aggression. Conversely, if intention is present but no harm is actually committed, this would still be counted as a case of aggression. So, so long as the intention is there to cause some form of harm, we would call those types of behaviors aggressive behaviors. Aggression can then be further subdivided into hostile aggression or instrumental aggression. Hostile aggression is just aggression in which one's goal is to inflict pain or injury on another person. The end of that scenario is just the aggressive behavior and it is conducted for the sake of that aggressive behavior. So if you were to think about revenge, for example, revenge would oftentimes be considered hostile aggression because the goal of those behaviors is to cause injury or pain to another person or being, I guess. Conversely, there's instrumental aggression, and this is aggression or harm that is the result of some step along the way towards some goal where the actual end goal doesn't really have anything to do with the harm. It's just someone got harmed along the way, and this would still be counted, technically speaking, as aggression because occasionally one could use sort of the harm as a means for getting some kind of information. So oftentimes when people are torturing somebody, well, hopefully that doesn't happen very often, but that would fall under the class of instrumental aggression, where the goal isn't necessarily to cause pain, it's to get information. And the causing of pain is just a means to an end in that regard. Now, if you accidentally hurt someone in your way towards some goal, technically, again, this doesn't qualify as aggression because no intention to cause any harm or pain was present. Now, aggression is oftentimes talked about from evolutionary perspectives because aggression is unbelievably widespread across the entirety of the animal kingdom. Now, just please remember that the evolutionary approach attempts to explain behaviors and traits according to how they confer advantages or disadvantages to the success of an organism to pass on its genetic information. And so the idea here is that most behaviors or traits that we observe in today's world, at least at some point in our evolutionary past, were successful or conferred successes in mating and reproduction upon our ancestors. Now, according to the evolutionary perspective, men and women in that binary category tend to aggress for different reasons. So when it comes to men, the two common things that get talked about are for establishing dominance and sexual jealousy. And these two support the passing on of genetic information in two slightly different ways. So the idea of establishing dominance is that it provides better selection of mates because oftentimes those who are considered to be dominant, and this applies not only to men of human beings, but also of other animals, that those who are dominant provide a better ability to protect mates and to rear offspring and to gather resources and in the same way. And in today's world, many of, <clears throat> excuse me, these selection pressures still apply, but it need not be with muscles. In many ways, having a large bank account and a Ferrari is a similar means of using one's resources to be able to establish this type of dominance. Now, the other type of reason where people aggress is, or at least men, is sexual jealousy. And this is thought to help support notions of paternity, because at the end of the day, while a woman can be certain of her offspring being hers, there is this nagging doubt for many men that the offspring are not necessarily theirs. And in today's world, we're like, this is a lack of trust and maybe not a healthy relationship. But for much of the time, not only for human beings, but again, animals in general, there's no guarantee for a male that the offspring that its mate is having are actually its. And the way in which to prevent that sort of anxiety, you could say, is by continually attacking all other males that could potentially approach your mates 
because if they never come close there's no possibility that they could fertilize the mate and then the alpha or whoever is doing the aggressing in this case ends up raising children that are not actually the children of this male yeah. conversely women are thought or females just across the animal kingdom really are thought to aggress primarily to protect their offspring and notice that ultimately all of these reasons even though slightly different for across the genders are ultimately all about ensuring that one's own kin survives well not only kin but one's children So another factor that comes up a lot when we're talking about biology and aggression is testosterone. And so testosterone is a hormone that is present not only in human beings, but again, across at least as far as I know, most mammals, but I would imagine it's actually prevalent in most animals really. Um, now it doesn't necessarily cause aggression directly speaking, but it is for sure related such that the higher levels of testosterone a person has, or just an animal again, the more likely they are to show aggressive behaviors and the lower the testosterone levels, the less likely they are to show these aggressive behaviors. And this can be shown experimentally where people modulate the testosterone levels in animals, thereby artificially increasing it will lead to increased aggression behaviors. And by artificially decreasing it, you can actually reduce the degree of aggressive behaviors that these animals show. Of course, that's unethical to do in human beings, but I suppose you could measure human beings now who get testosterone sort of, I think, not replacement surgery, I don't know, but it seems like in the United States now, maybe other countries, that for old men, you can actually give them a bunch of testosterone because they're afraid of getting old as far as I can imagine. Um, anyhow, one could compare the degree of aggressive behaviors before and after this to see if there were some type of difference. I'm unaware if such studies have actually been done. Another thing that is important to remember is across all sexes, so male, female, or intersex for that matter, all possess testosterone. Right? There are no human beings who don't have any testosterone. All people have different amounts of testosterone, and on average, males tend to have more testosterone than females, but this does not mean that females do not have testosterone. Right? The same is true for the estrogens as well. And males have them too. It's just there's less concentration than in female body. I've never seen any literature show that how or what side intersex individuals lean on. Um, and my guess is that would be specific to the way in which each specific case sort of develops in their developmental cycle. Now, testosterone is not purely linked to bio. I mean, it's not all biological. Now, a lot of research has shown, for example, that people who are in prison tend to have higher rates of testosterone than the average population. And of course, in the early days, this was like, oh my God, if people have too much testosterone, they're destined to be basically evil, bad people, and they will commit violence and so on and so forth. But this is not necessarily the case. Just because somebody has high testosterone doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to become violent people. And we'll talk about context and its influence on aggression a lot. But on the other side of this coin, research has also started to show that whenever human beings, again, regardless of sex, are engaged in either violent or competitive or dangerous or even just sexually arousing situations, that their bodies will ramp up the production of testosterone. And so they will tend to have more testosterone in their systems. Now, think about the type of place a prison is. Chances are it's not a very relaxed and cooperative and all fun-loving egalitarian place, but rather it is most cases violent and competitive and dangerous in the sense that people perceive constantly threats to themselves. And this state of existence is likely to lead to increased rates of testosterone, which those are correlated then with increased aggressive behaviors leading to the likelihood of more aggressive behaviors, which contributes to the environment being more competitive and more violent, which leads to, again, an increase in testosterone. And that can be a pretty vicious cycle. And it leads one to wonder about the efficacy of actually using the types of prison systems that we have today for rehabilitation, when in many ways you're actually just training the biology biological system to act even more aggressively, or at least to bias it towards aggressive behaviors. So when it comes to whether aggression is innate or not, there is actually a lot of evidence to point towards that there is sort of innate functions of aggression, but we also have really good systems for modulation, which we'll talk about in a second. But for a long time, people thought that 
aggression, at least specific types of it, were just sort of destined to be, and that was how it was. So examples of things not only of humans, but just like cats were destined to attack rats, and that was just how it went. And there could not be a cat that wouldn't attack a rat because it was programmed to do so. But in 1961, a researcher raised a baby cat and a baby rat together and found that the cat did not attack the rat. In fact, they became pretty good friends. And anybody who has raised a baby dog and a baby cat together has probably had similar experiences where the two animals get along just fine. In fact, pet owners over the years have raised all manner of different animals in close proximity to one another, and many of them actually tend to form very reliable bonds. What was further interesting was that this cat, once it was raised with this rat, did not aggress towards other rats that it encountered later in life, but rather they were conferred the same sort of gentle benefit that the original rat friend along whom it was raised received from the cat. Um, of course, this could be problematic for the rat because if it now believes that the cat is friendly, it will chances are treat other cats in the same way and that could ultimately lead to its demise. This is one of the reasons why they tell human beings not to feed wild animals, because while you might be a very kind individual, if you desensitize an animal to human beings, it will tend to interact more with human beings, and not all human beings interact at a sort of above board level with lots of animals that we come across for a multitude of reasons. This is why you should just generally not feed wild animals. Going back to the innateness, so also using rats, they raised rats in total isolation such that they never interacted with another rat while they were growing up. And then when they're exposed to other rats along with other creatures, they will tend to show aggressive behaviors towards their own kind, which of course happens with normal rats too. The fascinating thing here is that the manner in which they either show threat responses or displays and then actually perform certain attacks on the other rats will follow almost exactly the same patterns as rats that are raised in sort of a normal or healthy environment, meaning that certain patterns and behaviors for how to display threat and aggression need not actually be learned, but seems to be genetically hard coded into creatures. And Looking at humans, for example, you could see maybe not in the manner in which we threaten others, but we do have certain types of body postures and facial expressions that seem to be common throughout all of humanity in the forms in which they show aggression. You could say the same thing about dogs, and dogs is another animal that humans have a lot of interaction and experience with, and many dogs, when they're afraid or they're angry, will show those behaviors in very similar ways across the entire sort of species set of those animals. Considering some more animals, if we were to talk about our closest relatives, so both the chimpanzees and bonobos are currently considered to be our most close living relatives across the entirety of the animal kingdom. And both of them share approximately 98% of their genetic sequences with us. So when someone says that an animal shares 98% of its genetic information with ours, basically this means of all the sequences of genetic base pairs that we have, about 98% of those are identical across these two animals. And so human beings have, along with the apes, roughly about 3 billion base pairs in our genetic sequence. This is just the pair combinations of individual nucleotides, and about 98% of these sequences are identical. Of course, there are some different estimates of it moves and ranges depending on what parts of the genetic sequence you're looking at between about 96% and 98%. Um, but ultimately, this means that most of the information that codes what a human being is, is very similar to what codes an ape, especially these two particular apes. Uh, just for reference, for any two human beings on the planet that live today, the estimate of genetic similarity between them is roughly 99.9%. Again, meaning that of all the different base pairs that we have, the similarity that exists across all of us is unbelievably high. That 0.1% of the difference in genetic base pairs could be attributed to differences in gene expression. And this is largely why people have different colored eyes or hair or skin color. It's not that there's any functional or fundamental difference in the human beings themselves, but rather just subtle variations in all of the blueprints that exist for us.
but those are ultimately unbelievably small differences. It pales in comparison to our similarity. Anyhow, going back to chimpanzees and bonobos, these two animals get talked a lot about when it comes to aggression because in many ways we sit somewhere in between both of them. So chimpanzees are actually highly aggressive and very violent with one another, so much so that they actually get into huge fights constantly when they're eating food. They practice a form of polyamory in their tribes, not because of necessarily them enjoying sleeping around, but by guaranteeing that all males and females mate with each other, there's no way for the males to know which children are actually theirs, because as soon as male chimpanzees realize that certain children are not of their own, they will actually kill all of those children. And so chimpanzees are ultimately so violent that this form of unknown paternity is one of the only ways that they can guarantee that their species continues to live on. Further, chimpanzees are the only other species on the planet other than human beings that we know of that engages in a ritualized form of group conflict, meaning that you have groups of males who will get together and systematically attack and kill groups of males from other tribes. And human beings and chimpanzees are basically the only species on the planet that takes part in something like this. On the other side of this spectrum are bonobos, and bonobos are probably some of the most cooperative of all of the animals that we currently are exposed to in the world today. And in these, their sort of tribes or societies, however you wanted to talk about them, they use ultimately again sex very effectively and will ultimately have a whole little group tribe orgy before any type of task that they will take part in that could lead to conflict. So even before every meal where people could potentially, well the bonobos, could potentially fight over the food that they're going to eat, they will actually just all get together and do each other a little bit and then they ultimately have large degrees of endorphin rushes and probably also the estrogens released into their bloodstreams, which promotes bonding and calmness. And so they're able to just eat in peace. I'm not sure how much of this is actually related to their behaviors, but bonobos also demonstrate a matriarchal society where the females of the tribe seem to be the more dominant in deciding sort of how they do stuff. In fact, Again, they will, if they notice two males fighting, they will gang up on the males and again, just use sex to calm them down. Um, but it seems to work for them and they get into a very small degree of conflict. So coming back again, just to animals in general, including us in that because we too are animals, is that Aggression is pretty much common across all animals. We, we present it in slightly different ways, but at the end of the day, aggression seems to be something that is consistently manifest throughout the entirety of the animal kingdom. And this leads people who are evolutionary theorists, whether evolutionary psychologists or biologists, to believe that there are some very, very strong evolutionary benefits to aggression. And it's not hard to imagine that while it might be detrimental in our modern day society, for many things, aggressive behaviors are unbelievably successful. And when we're talking about aggression, we oftentimes start thinking about one human being aggressive towards another, which can also be helpful in certain cases. But think about if there was nowhere to run from a lion and all you could do was attack the lion instead of just lying down and being eaten, chances are in those last moments, a human will try and attack the lion just like most creatures will do when they're trapped. And in those moments, even though many might not survive, those aggressive behaviors are highly beneficial because they give you the best chance of surviving. One of the reasons we tend to look at aggression so negatively now is because in our modern world where we have so many human beings and so many societal rules and we have built structures to make our lives easier, aggression no longer provides as much of a benefit to us as it maybe once did doesn't mean it's removed from us because society has existed for much less time than evolutionary sort of changes happen. But now it's all not all doom and gloom because it is also considered that almost all animals have very complex systems ultimately at the end of the day that allow them to modulate their aggressive behaviors. So there are not really many creatures that run around just aggressing everything. 
they are a few creatures that are just unbelievably on the aggressive side, but most animals tend to be able to modulate where and when they are aggressive. That there are certain and specific contextual cues that will lead to them either displaying aggression or not. And this is again considered to be of great benefit because yes, aggression allows for the success of certain sort of biological lines, but if you were just to be aggressive to everything, you would probably not live very long either. So at the end of the day, pretty much any type of creature can be violent. Even bonobos have been shown to be violent in certain types of contexts, but ultimately a lot of that depends on the situation in which an animal finds itself in. Now, this is also just unbelievably true for when animals feel threatened, whether it's human beings or mice or whatever. When animals feel threatened or cornered, they are unbelievably likely to show aggressive behaviors and they need not be actually physically cornered. Even the perception of being threatened is oftentimes enough to increase the rate at which an animal will show aggressive behaviors. Now, coming back to focus more on human beings, when it comes to different cultures, uh, aggression is ultimately present in all cultures that we know of, but the degree to which aggressive behaviors are condoned and ultimately manifest themselves are actually quite different in different types of cultures. One of the patterns that we do tend to see, and this is just because this is the type of contrast that we study a lot, is that people from individualistic cultures actually tend to show slightly higher rates of aggression than people from collectivist cultures. But please note that there are lots of different types of aggressive behaviors, and really now modern literature is starting to look at Maybe it's not enough to count only specific types of things, like how many people in different cultures will punch somebody else in the face, but looking at many different forms of aggression and how those are different across different cultures. Now, just because one culture has shown lots of aggression at one point in time does not mean that they are destined to always show high degrees of aggression over time. And the converse, of course, is possible too. You could have very cooperative and sort of egalitarian centered cultures and some circumstance could happen that ultimately leads them to be required to display large degrees of aggression. And this can lead those cultures and societies to ultimately move from a more peaceful to a more aggressive stance. And this can ultimately just fluctuate over time. One of, I guess, also just on one note, the largest things that determines when both individuals and cultures as a whole will tend to display many of these aggressive behaviors is the degree to which they perceive threats to their existence. So cultures that are constantly being invaded by some other society will tend to develop more aggressive patterns, whereas cultures that are almost entirely self-reliant, they're easily able to trade with those around them and do not require said trade to maintain their own survival are unlikely to develop very high degrees of aggression. One specific thing within different types of cultures that's very important to keep track of are cultures of honor. And what we mean by cultures of honor is just that there are some cultures that hold honor to be a unbelievably high or important value, whereas other cultures tend to look at this trait as being less important. It's not that there are places where people are like honor is stupid, but there are some places that almost idolize honor and there are other places where it's just less important. Now, in cultures where honor is considered to be important, they also think of this as a very positive cultural trait and will oftentimes actually look down or ridicule cultures that do not perceive or look at honor in the same way. Unfortunately, when looking at literature today, there is an actually significant body of literature that shows that in cultures of honor, there is actually a higher rate of aggression and violence that seems to take place than cultures in which honor is not as prevalent. One of the most common ways that this is seen is that in cultures of honor, homicide rates are actually significantly higher than in cultures where honor is not really emphasized as much. And this can actually be seen even in different parts of the United States, where places in the South are considered to be much more focused on honor, whereas 
places in the north are considered to have sort of a less of an emphasis on this. And people find that they are, they tend to be more homicides in those areas where people think about honor as being very important. And one of the sort of explanations that's been put forth for why this is the case is that it comes to the background of sustaining populations. And so when one has agricultural backgrounds, in agricultural systems, one requires a high degree of uh, sort of cooperation. And it's very difficult to sort of steal things because you have a piece of land on which you've grown some sort of corn or fava beans or chili peppers or whatever it happens to be. And your whole little town kind of works together to reap the benefits of these things because no one person can really grow food for everybody, right? For most of our history, we didn't have combines and fancy agricultural machines to allow us to cultivate thousands and thousands of hectares. So it ultimately promotes a more communal way of living. Whereas those who are herding, so whether it's cattle here or sheep or cows or camels or whatever it happens to be, if you're reliant on this herd of animals for your existence because you can sell them the meat, the milk, so on and so forth, these are something that can be easily stolen and taken away. And so one needs to be able to be much more vigilant and defend against the possibility of theft. And ultimately, now, when one is saying or trading, it is only your word that allows you to guarantee that those cattle or horses or sheep or whatever are actually yours. And some people think that this could be one of the reasons or origins for this idea of this strong degree of honor that exists and why a lot of systems around honor are actually more prone to violence than in situations where we do not find this sort of high emphasis on honor. And one can actually find similar patterns across the world where the more sort of agricultural roots that certain area has, the less emphasis they tend to place on honor. Whereas the more the background of those specific areas was on herding for one's subsistence, the greater the degree or focus one finds of those cultures on honor. Now, just to see some other patterns, one also tends to find that in situations where, and this is largely focused on the US because of students and guns, but students and cultures of honor tend to bring more guns to school. They also have more violence in those schools and locations. And then one, uh, this is now true of across the entirety of the world, but there are much higher rates of domestic violence in cultures of honor than cultures where not much emphasis is put on it, which seems a little bit counter to the idea of honor if you were to ask me, but this is just ultimately something that is quite common. And very sadly, both genders actually view physical violence against women as appropriate when it is perceived that she has caused or violated some kind of sort of dishonor, especially to the, fa the husband, but to the family at large as well. And one finds across much of the world still a high degree of honor killings that happen still for this sake of when a woman or especially a young woman either wants to go out on a date or wants to express her own freedoms, that this can be thought to bring dishonor to a family and there's still a high degree of murders that take place just based on this idea. And it need not be as extreme as, of course, murdering this woman, but the prevalence of even beating one of them because she has done something that slighted the husband in situations where honor is thought of as a very sort of high value, this just tends to happen much more. Here was an interesting study done to show this type of pattern, and I'm skipping over some of the other findings they found to focus specifically on the biological responses because I think that is ultimately quite fascinating. And so the paper itself is called Insult, Aggression, and the Southern Culture of Honor, and was conducted by Cohen, Nisbet, Baudry, and Schwartz. Now, they conducted several studies in this paper across more than 200 participants, and all of these studies were conducted at the University of Michigan. And I believe this was conducted in 1996. Now, half of the participants who were used across these studies were raised in northern states, and it was considered that these people tended to have less of an emphasis on honor in the cultures that they were raised. And then the other half were from southern states, where there was a larger degree of emphasis placed on honor. Now, further, 
both halves were split then into experimental and control groups. And so what happened in the experimental groups is they would be walking from one part of the experiment to another, and then they would be bumped into by an accomplice who was in on it. And after bumping into them, the accomplice would ultimately just insult them sort of under their breath a little bit, and then they would continue to walk on. And they wanted to examine what happened to these people. And so I'll talk about the graphs in just a moment. But what they also found is the likelihood of these individuals to become aggressive and to denigrate that individual was much higher when they were raised in the South and had a higher emphasis placed on honor in terms of their sort of cultural upbringing than people who were raised in the Northern states. And now please don't take this to mean that all people from Northern states are just nicer people than people from Southern states, right? It doesn't quite work like that. We're looking at subtle biases that result in or change how human beings tend to show aggressive behaviors because of the cultures in which they are raised. So the impact that culture has on us. This is not dooming us to act in one way or the other, it's just biasing us to act in certain ways. Now, here in this set of graphs, one can see actually some quite fascinating results. Here in the control condition, no one bumped into them. So here you can see both Southern and Northern subjects are pretty much the same. And here we're looking at their levels of testosterone as changing from a baseline at the start of an experiment to when it was measured towards the end. And here there was some degree of an increase in testosterone. And this is likely due just to the uncertainty situation and interacting in the experiment itself. These types of fluctuations in testosterone are actually quite normal on a day-to-day -day for any human being. Here though, you can see that when they were insulted, many of the Northern subjects did not experience a very drastic raise in their testosterone levels, which leads one to also confirm Include that they were less likely to perform aggressive behaviors following this. While you can see for Southern um, participants, the increase or change in their testosterone levels was quite stark in comparison to their Northern counterparts after they were insulted. Now, oh, I have just put both graphs on this. Um, anyhow, the other graph is looking at cortisol levels actually. And here what one finds is that a similar pattern is observed, whereby those who are in the sort of from northern backgrounds tend to show much less of a cortisol response compared to their southern counterparts. And cortisol is oftentimes related to stress, because when we feel stressed, we tend to release a bunch of adrenaline into our bodies to prevent or to prepare us for either fighting or running away. And cortisol is then released after the fact to sort of reduce the levels of adrenaline in our body. And so we oftentimes measure the amount of cortisol in a body as an index for how stressed that individual felt. And so here again, you can see that the Northern subjects experience much less of a cortisol spike as compared to the Southern subjects. And here you can see that this relationship of different cultures of ultimately emphasis on honor leads to actual physiological differences in how one responds to the external world. Now looking a little bit at gender and aggression. So one important thing to keep in mind, I suppose, is that when it comes to extreme cases of physical violence, they're almost always committed by men as opposed to women. It's very uncommon for women to commit extreme acts of physical violence. When we're talking about things that are less physical, like running around with a bunch of machine guns or actually throwing someone into a wall or something like that, when we're not talking about those types of cases, the distinction between the genders and their ability to commit aggressive behaviors is actually much smaller than many people tend to think. And this difference can actually be almost entirely removed when you provoke individuals. So when either males or females are provoked, they will both tend to show aggressive tendencies in pretty much the same type of way. And here you can just see this graph is specifically referring to violence by one partner to another. And here you can see that rates are actually fairly high. 
So I won't really go into all of them. You're welcome to look at this in your textbook in more detail. But I guess one of the saddest things to just be aware of is when we're looking at any type of physical violence, the blue bar is representing towards women and the orange bars are representing towards men. And I'm assuming this is a data looking primarily at heterosexual couples. I'm unsure of whether this includes any kind of non-standard heterosexual relationships. So I just don't know that. But here you can see that one in three women will experience some type of physical violence by an intimate partner in their lives. And a little bit over one in four men will also experience physical violence by their intimate partner. Now, not all of this is including severe degrees of attack or something like this, but ultimately any kind of physical violence by one partner on another is highly problematic. And so the fact that this is that prevalent in our society is definitely something to consider and not to shy away from. Yeah. Um, another, I guess, important thing here to think about is that this doesn't refer to all individuals. So there, it's not that the least violent man is still more violent or aggressive than the most aggressive or violent woman. This is not how it works. This is rather just on average, men tend to perform certain types of aggressive behaviors at a higher rate than women. And this can also now have cultural differences. For example, women in Australia tend to be on average more aggressive than men in Korea. And it's not that Australian women can be sort of cannot be egalitarian, just like Korean men couldn't be aggressive, but rather it just seems to be the case that on averages that people in Australia seem to have a higher emphasis on aggressive behaviors than do people who live in Korea. And so culture has a dramatic influence on what type of aggressive behaviors are acceptable for the two types of genders and which ones are not. Another difference that we tend to find across genders has to do with what is referred to as relational aggression. And relational aggression is the term used to talk about when one harms another person through the manipulation of their relationships and this is oftentimes done in covert forms, though it can oftentimes be done also in overt ones. And so examples of this would be spreading rumors or shunning people or excluding them from certain types of social groups, or even just shaming them privately or publicly. And then, you know, in front of their face or behind their back. And all of these things are means by which to actually hurt someone that doesn't require you to actually commit any type of physical violence upon them. And this form of aggression is actually much more commonly perpetrated by women than men. But again, that's not to say that men don't take part in this form of aggression as well. Now, another sad trend that we're noticing over the recent years is that this form of aggression is actually becoming more and more common. And it's thought to be due to our increased reliance and in use of online forms of communication, because this form of communication lends itself very well to this type of aggression it's much easier to sort of harass someone online than it is to punch somebody in the face, especially if most of your communication happens via some kind of online medium. And this is then highly related to the incidences of online bullying and harassment, which have some very dramatic consequences, especially for the youth of today, because oftentimes when one is talking about the youth, we talk about the things that are dangerous to them that are stuff like pornography or a lack of morals or a loss of religion or sexual deviance and predators. But it turns out that one of the sort of most damaging things that can happen to minors of today is the bullying that takes place and harassment from their peers. And the advent and mass adoption of online forms of communication are just exacerbating this problem. And ultimately, like I said before, this has some very, very dire consequences on the health and lives of the minors of today. I guess just on that note, when one is talking about that just bullying and that kind of stuff is just normal and kids will be kids, that's like saying boys will be boys when they're talking about sexually harassing women. 
it doesn't make it okay just saying boys will be boys, right? It doesn't work like that. The fact that bullying exists among children underlies certain systemic problems that we have in the way that we are dealing with our societies and certain needs that are not being met for these children, right? Just because we as a generation might have been bullied or bullied others in our lives doesn't mean that that is normal or healthy for the next generations to do the same. Okay, moving on now to how do we learn to be aggressive? And so this oftentimes falls under what is referred to as the social cognitive learning theory. And this is the theory that we learn aggressive behaviors or altruistic behaviors really through ultimately two different mechanisms. The first being through imitation of those we see around us. And the second through cognitive processes that are ultimately about the evaluation of those types of behaviors and the plans and expectations we form around them. Now, when it comes to children, they're unbelievably likely to imitate behaviors, especially of the adults who are in their lives. And it turns out that actually one of the best predictors of whether people will be violent towards one of their intimate partners is actually if they see their parents or caregivers when they're young be violent to one another. If they see it, it ultimately normalizes this type of behavior and they will then accept that that is a normal type of behavior. Now, again, please note that just because a child might see their parents be violent doesn't guarantee that they too will be violent, but the odds that they will be violent are much higher than children who are raised in environments in which their parents are not violent with one another. Another factor that determines a lot of whether we will imitate other people's behavior is how famous they are, how sort of esteemed they are, or how much respect they have from culture around or in which we are all raised. The greater they are sort of influential in this context, the more likely we are to copy their behaviors, even as adults. This is one of the reasons, again, why children will so strongly copy the behaviors of their parents, because when you're very young, for most very young children, their parents are the equivalent of deities almost. And so there are no people who have higher status in their eyes and thus all of their behaviors are worth copying, at least when they're very young. This also can show you why in today's world and culture of influencers, for example, that this can lead to all kinds of problematic behavior. I mean, it can lead to positive outcomes as well if the influencers are very successful at only demonstrating positive behaviors, but most human beings are unable to only have positive behaviors. And so when one is put into this limelight, so to speak, it's very easy to sway that needle in both directions. Probably one of the most famous studies that gets talked about when we're looking at how people imitate and learn aggression is oftentimes called the Bobo doll experiment. The actual paper itself is referred to as the transmission of aggression through imitation of aggressive models. And it was conducted by Bandura, Ross and Ross in 1961. So here there were 72 children, half of them were boys, half of them were girls. There were three different conditions. There was the control group, there was a third of them who saw an aggressive model, so a person who beat up this doll that oftentimes gets talked about, and another third of them were with a non-aggressive model who just sort of played with some puzzle pieces and blocks and left the Bobo doll completely alone. Now, these groups also either had a male model or a female model, and this was again half and half across all of these groups. And so the way that this worked is that the children were put into a room and they were given some toys to play with in one corner while there were some other toys, including the Bobo doll in a diagonally across corner at which the model would come in, be introduced to the child by the experimenter, and then the model would now play with those toys. And they would do so either aggressively, whereby they would punch, kick, throw, and hit with a hammer this Bobo doll, all the while muttering things like, hit him with a hammer, kick him in the face, oh wow, this person is really rough, blah, 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 versus they would sort of sit there and play with blocks, and they did this for about 10 minutes. And following this, the experimenters would take the children to a different room, again, with some toys. They would allow them to sort of relax a little bit playing with these toys, and then bring them to a third room again where the Bobo doll was present, and then their behaviors were ultimately documented. 
Now, when people tend to talk about this, especially on the internet or in blogs or even just in common language, even to some degree in your textbook, one notices that here it is summarized by just saying that those children who noticed the aggressive behaviors were more aggressive than the ones who didn't. But it turns out that the actual behavior of children was far more complex than just they were more aggressive or not. And I mean, yes, they did show higher rates of aggression, but it's again, like I said, a little bit more complicated. So looking at this table here, the rates of behaviors here are as coded by judges. This is showing the control group over here. So this is what you can compare it to. The two columns right here are for those that had aggressive models, further subdivided into whether the model was female or male. Same thing for the non-aggressive behaviors. Here you'll see aggregates or classes of these types of behaviors, along with them being subdivided by the children. So when they're talking about imitating physical aggression, this is did the children kick and punch and throw the doll in the same way that the model did when they were present? Now, of course, those types of behaviors in the non-aggressive situation would have had to have been manifested by the children themselves because they did not actually see those behaviors. Here you can see a strong difference between boys versus girls, where boys are showing much more of those imitated violent behaviors as compared to the girls. And you can see a strong difference by model. So when the male model showed those violent behaviors, boys were much more likely by double really to show those same types of aggressive behaviors than if they were modeled by a female. You see that even though there is some a higher rate at which girls also perform these violent behaviors under the sort of condition where they saw male models, the difference is not nearly as stark. When it comes here to in the non-aggressive situation, you see another very interesting pattern, even though these are very small numbers, so I would be hesitant to say that these are significant differences and might just be random noise. But here, when the female model was non-aggressive, you actually see a higher rate of aggressive behaviors by the female children than when a male model was non-aggressive. And you see the opposite pattern here for boys, which I think is just an interesting pattern, but like I said, very small, so it might just be random noise. Another now, I guess, moving on to imitating verbal aggression. So this is, as I mentioned, when the models were beating up the Bobo doll, they also said things like, oh, hit them in the face, pow, kablooey, that kind of stuff. And so they wanted to see how often would people copy these languages. And so here you can see again, the children copied the language when the model matched their own gender. So female children matched those words oftentimes when the female model was present, but not often when the male was present. And you see the opposite happen when male children were exposed to the two different models, whereby they indicate much more of that verbal aggression when the model was a male beating up the Bobo doll. Now, going into the next set, I'll just tell you kind of what these are, and then you are welcome to look at these numbers in more depth as you want, or you can just look up from your citations this actual article. Mallet aggression refers to them using the mallet that was originally used to beat up the Bobo doll to actually attack or hit other toys within the room itself. When they're now punching the Bobo doll, this was just looking at additional times in which they hit the Bobo doll because most of the time the model either kicked through or hit with a hammer the Bobo doll but did not directly punch it. And so they were looking at this novel type of aggressive behavior. Non imitative aggression behaviors were any type of behaviors coded as aggressive that were not demonstrated by the model originally. And then aggressive gunplay is that there was a dart play a dart gun present in the room as well in the final condition and they looked at how much did children use that gun and how often did they shoot things not only the bobo doll but just toys in general within that room now yes it is true that those children who witnessed an aggressive model acted more aggressively than when they did not but I think something that's very important to see is that it is much more nuanced. Whereas for example, when it comes to punches and looking at male children, there's not that much difference between when they saw an aggressive model, a non-aggressive model and control.
you actually see a large degree of similarity across this. Further, I think it's quite interesting when you look at the children themselves and what type of model, where here, male children punched the doll much more when there was a female model who beat up the doll as opposed to a male model, which is just interesting in how one goes about understanding the imitation behaviors, especially around aggression, when it comes to children and adults around them. All right, alcohol. So alcohol is widely related or connected to aggressive behaviors. This we see in our common media, in our exposure when we're out and about, well, not out and about that much these days, but it is ultimately and sadly true that there is a reliable pattern or connection between alcohol and aggressive behaviors. And this is conventionally thought or at least talked about to be because alcohol lowers our inhibition and caution and this leads us to be just more aggressive. And the idea there being that by lowering our inhibition, we were already naturally inclined to be aggressive. And so it just shuts down our sort of don't be aggressive circuits. But it's actually a little bit more complex than this. So it has been shown that when we consume alcohol, one of the first parts of our brain to sort of suffer the effects of alcohol is the prefrontal cortex. And this begins to show effects even after a single drink where you don't need to even be feeling inebriated. It is very susceptible to alcohol. Now, the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain, it, you could think about it as behind your eyes and forehead. And this is the region of your brain that is very highly associated with complex planning, with abstract thought, or complex information processing. And when this part of the brain begins to become impaired, we're not very good at understanding context or paying attention to multiple different cues that could be signaling information about a situation. And this could ultimately lead to us only becoming hyper-focused to certain obvious cues without paying attention to other more subtle ones. And I think your textbook gives a very good example of this, of if you are drunk and someone steps on your toe, especially if you're a man and they're also a man, you're much more likely to just punch them in the face if you're drunk than if you're sober, because when you're sober, you might realize that the bar is actually really crowded and somebody else jostled them, which led to them stepping on your foot, and it's not something they did on purpose. But that complex degree of integration of all of those contextual features is heavily reliant on our prefrontal cortices, and when those are ultimately impaired, we're not as well able to take into account social context. Now, this is not really related to alcohol, but another place in which you could see this is that for very young children, and really just as they're growing, the prefrontal cortex is one of the final parts of the brain that is brought fully online. In fact, it's thought to be fully developed only once people reach the age of about 25. And this is why a lot of sort of social and abstract rules don't really make sense to children and young teens, whereas for older people, they're like, no, this is just how society works. It's because the degree of emphasis on this abstract, conceptual, and highly interrelated ideas are just not as solidified yet for a young child. They just, those systems aren't as turned on, I suppose, or as well developed. And it's not that they're dumb or they don't get it, it's just their brains aren't yet working in that same way. So don't just be mad at children because they don't understand that they're sort of complex situations about the world. Another factor that comes up a lot when it comes to alcohol and aggression is this idea of the think-drink effect. And this is somewhat like self-fulfilling prophecies, except related just to ourselves. Now, many people have an idea of what they're like when they drink a lot. Some people are just like, you know, I get really sad when I drink whiskey, or I get crazy when I drink tequila, or no matter what I drink, I'm just a really happy person, or no matter what I drink, I'm a really angry person. And it turns out that the way you think of yourself when you are drunk, well, what you think you will be like when you're drunk, actually has a dramatic impact on how we will be when we are drunk. Oh. Some other physiological factors that influence our degree of aggression behaviors are pretty much anything that can cause us
discomfort. So when we are in states of discomfort, we will aggress at higher rates. So things like chronic pain, high temperatures, high levels of humidity, really any type of pollution, be it air pollution, noise pollution, light pollution, all of these things can increase our rates of aggression, large crowds that we don't want to be in and make us feel uncomfortable. And even things like nauseous or bad smells will tend to increase the rates at which we feel aggressive. And I mean, a lot of this was done originally correlationally to show that in these contexts, people tended to be more aggressive. But since then, even experimentally, people have showed that you can manipulate these factors and people in situations in which these have been heightened will tend to demonstrate higher degrees of aggression towards others. Another factor, and this I mentioned earlier with the animals when we were talking about evolution, is that when one feels trapped, the rates of aggression tend to get very high. And this is probably because no one really likes to feel trapped. And when one is feeling trapped, it's unbelievably uncomfortable and anxiety causing. And those are both situations that lead to higher rates of aggressive behaviors. And ultimately, this is true for animals, not just humans, because humans are animals, right? Like an injured wild animal is more likely to attack other things than any other kind of animal. This is the same is true for human beings, right? If you've met someone who has chronic pain, they are much more irritable and likely to snap than people who have no pain in their bodies. It's just how it goes. Finally, especially if you fixated on the thing about heat, but many of those apply, is this connection between aggression and climate change. And this is something that is being talked about more and more and is being taken much more seriously, actually. So one interesting thing mentioned in your textbook is a meta-analysis looking at the last 12,000 years, so since 10,000 BC, actually correlated the differences in temperature of the planet, because it's actually fluctuated quite a bit during this time, and they correlated these changes in temperature with the degree of violence that they have noticed. And they found that increased rates of violence tend to coincide with increased rates of global temperature. And so just in case you're curious, the way that they did that is they measured core samples. So this is when you drill out a really long, relatively thin stick, basically, from the ground. And it's just a long core. And you can look at different bits of sort of rock and gas layers that have been present in this to infer what the temperatures were likely to be like at different times, because the further down you go along this core, the further back in time you were going. And then they examined basically human bones for the long time that we don't have sort of relevant today historical history in looking at bones for how much damage they took, specifically damage from tools. So things like spears, and the idea here is that if you have spear marks on your bones, chances are another human came along and stabbed that person, and they're dead. Well, not just time, I guess. And they looked at different parts and clusters where they have found sort of leftover graves or different tribes were thought to have existed, and they ultimately correlated the degree of indicators of violence with temperatures and found a reliable pattern showing that violence tends to be higher during times of increased heat. Now, coming to today and looking into the future, it's not just that the temperature is likely to increase that will lead to more violent behaviors, even though a reliable pattern that we notice all the time is that there's a larger degree of crime and violence committed during the summer than the winter, and also more aggressive behaviors are committed in cities that are just naturally warmer than cities that are colder. But other factors that are leading to an increased rate of aggression having to do specifically with climate change is not just the temperature, but the fact that overall economic and social factors are beginning to suffer and will continue to suffer more and more. And this is highly correlated with aggression. What we mean by this is that the less and less economic and social sort of benefits that people tend to have, the less likely they are to be able to go to good schools, to have upward social mobility, to have childcare, to have effective nutrition. And all of these things lead to tremendous stresses on the body, not only of the individual, but of the entire sort of family that they exist in. And all of these factors can lead to much higher rates of aggression. Because if you have to fight for every meal you get, you are going to be much more aggressive 
then if no matter what and when you decide to go look in a refrigerator that belongs to you and there is always food, you just don't need to be as aggressive. So when people are constantly fighting for their right to live, even if it's not like you're fighting lions, but you just perceive that you have to because of the state in society that you live in, it leads to a higher degree of aggressive behaviors. And so ultimately climate change is leading to a larger and larger discrepancy between the sort of has's and has nots in this world today. And that's likely to lead to increased rates of aggression. Another factor that is ultimately related to this is the sort of threat to people's livelihood. So as climate change becomes more and more serious, we will begin to see fairly dramatic changes in the way that the world functions today. And a lot of times we tend to focus just on increases in temperature, but for example, changes in the carbon dioxide balance of the planet will change what plants grow well and what plants don't grow so well. And if we go too far out of equilibrium, many of the plants that we use for our agricultural bases will not be able to produce at the same rates that they produce today, which will cause huge and dramatic problems for the world at large. And so if you were to think about sort of agriculture just by itself, there are about 2.2 million people in this country just right now who are directly employed by agricultural systems. But immediately adjacent to this, so things like inspection or agricultural machinery or the trucking and freezing of vegetables, actually, sort of there's jobs about 20 to 25 million US citizens or even non-citizens, just people in the country are employed by these industries. And so if there is a collapse in agriculture, this is a huge amount of people whose livelihoods will be threatened. And when one's livelihood is threatened, this tends to dramatically increase rates of aggression. And not only just aggression towards other random individuals, but in situations where you see a person's livelihood get threatened, rates of domestic abuse actually skyrocket. So another example of this, just in case you wanted, would be to look at fisheries. As fisheries tend to collapse because of overfishing or increased acidification or collapses of ecosystems, many of those towns that are built around fisheries will no longer have viable sources of income. And what are you going to do with those people? It's not like they're just going to magically poof, disappear. They have to go somewhere.